Okay, this is it. All right. David, thank you. And Aaron, thank you for um, this great introduction and for a chance to share um, something special about Yosemite and our connection with China. Thank you all for jumping in this evening. Thanks to um, for um, the fellow who has allowed David to be the host for tonight's program with your Zoom account. That's much appreciated. So my name is Pete Devine and uh, Dave and Aaron and I used to work together in Yosemite National Park years ago as part of the park's um, incredibly excellent environmental education program, the Yosemite Institute. And um, I've lived most of my life in Yosemite at this point in an, an education role on the nonprofit side. Um, I used to be a park ranger, uh, as did some other people we know on tonight's program. Um, but I have really enjoyed working in the nonprofit side of National Park administration and management and stewardship. Um, so I am just eager to have a chance to share something that most people don't think about when they think about our national parks in the US, um, which is that uh, quite a few of them have sister national parks in other countries. The way a lot of cities have a sister city in another country, Yosemite and uh, some other parks have sister parks in other countries. Yosemite, I think, has 15 sister parks in other countries. Um, one of our previous superintendents wanted to make sure we had at least one on every continent, and we do, uh, but the very first two were in China. Uh, so uh, let me start off by asking the group a question, and I would love it if you had a moment to answer in the, in the chat function. If you've ever been to China, or if you were ever thinking you want to go to China, what what was your best experience or what would you most like to experience if you had a chance to go to China? What, what, what was your, your best experience or what draws you, what is it you want to go and see when you're in China? So I just would be curious if you um, either have been or are hoping for a trip there. Um, enter some stuff in the chat uh, function. That would be great. Uh, let's see. So um, in this title picture, Yosemite is in the middle. And then pictures from our two sister parks in China are on either side there. This is our former superintendent, Mike Tollefson, in front of a giant sequoia tree. He was invited by the Department of Interior that oversees the National Park Service to go on a trip to China to help the Chinese government consulting with them with a, a team of people from the Department of Interior on um, some national wildlife refuges that China was establishing. And while he was there, he met Chinese officials in their national park um, system, such as it is. And they said, what about a sister relationship between Yosemite and one of our parks in China? So this guy is the one who started it on the American end of our sister park relationships. Of all of our sister parks, our very first two were in China. And we are grateful to Mike Tollefson for that. Uh, going back to 2006. So our two sister parks are in different parts of the country. Uh, China is roughly the size of the United States, give or take. Uh, not the same shape, of course, and we have separate parcels with Alaska and Hawaiian territories. China is all, for the most part, in one piece. But in terms of surface area, they're roughly comparable. Uh, and of course, we know the population of China and the United States are uh, pretty comparable too. If you just take United States population and add just one billion, then they're the same. Uh, or if you take United States population and then double it, and then double it again, then you're then you're pretty close. Uh, so yeah, the population is completely different, but the uh, surface area. The square miles is roughly the same. Where the yellow arrows are show you where our two national parks are, our two sister parks. One uh, on the east coast, but not on the coast, a little bit inland. I like to tell people it's sort of equivalent to where maybe Shenandoah or Smoky Mountain National Park is in this country. And then the horizontal yellow arrow on the left in the middle of the country uh, is in Sichuan. You can't see it on this map, but where that yellow arrow is, is the start of the Tibetan Plateau and really the empty part of China uh, off to the west. So this would be roughly maybe where 
Denver or um, maybe Chengdu would be Denver and where our sister park is is where Yellowstone or Grand Teton is. Yeah, I got a question for you. Go for it. Uh, you may want to do this later, but the question is what constitutes a sister park? Yeah, um, it's a great question and it, it depends. It's a lot of different things. It's in the same way that um, Durango, for all I know, the sister city of Durango is Durango, Mexico, as a, as a guess. Uh, and, and I would guess that the city of Denver has got several sister cities in other countries. And what does that mean for those cities? It varies with um, the people who run those uh, sister parks or who run those cities and those arrangements. The same in a national park. Some superintendents, some administrations are very into this, very excited about it, very active. Others, it's, um, it's nice, but it's not something they spend a lot of time on. So we have a formal agreement on paper that uh, doesn't commit us to a lot of specifics, but it in general is saying that we will try to share resources, that we will stay in touch with each other, that we'll share ideas if we can. The ultimate sister park connection is to share staff. So we have had Yosemite Rangers uh, go to both of these parks and our sister parks in other countries. And we have had Rangers from China and our other sister park nations come and spend time in Yosemite, sometimes just a couple of days, sometimes a couple of months to really um, learn what they can from each other. So it's a sharing and learning and um, cooperative thing, but it, the activity level depends on, on the administration of um, the parks on both sides. Like it would with a, if Durango, Colorado has a sister relationship with Durango, Mexico. So um, the last time I was there was in September. I was supposed to be there just a couple of weeks ago, but of course it's not a good time to travel in China and the Chinese don't want any people uh, from America coming and bringing our germs um, in with us. So I was there in September and um, took uh, the high speed rail from our gateway city out to our uh, 226 kilometers per hour. Very, very impressive. Um, Here's the difference between China and the United States. China had no high-speed rail until the Olympics in 2008. They had none in 2008. And so just over 10 years, they've built more than 20,000 miles of high-speed rail. That's an incredible uh, technological investment that uh, we don't have any miles in this uh, country of ours. And I met with the park staff for one of our sister parks. Um, this is Wang Shan. Uh, uh, I'm the liaison between Yosemite and our sister parks in China. So we were reconnecting um, and formalizing our sister park agreement. And it was very nice to spend time with the administration. All of them speak at least a little bit of English, but we had English translators. I speak very little Chinese. Uh, so it was very helpful to conduct uh, business and friendship and relationship building in um, in English. Some of these people I have met before, the woman in the lower right corner uh, spent, um, I can't remember, a month or two in Yosemite about 10 years ago. And so nice to have a liaison relationship with my counterpart there. And here's, here's just the, the nature of visiting a national park. The English might not make perfect sense. It might not be the way we write it, but uh, nice ideas about flowers and mountains and uh, admiring and cherishes. You can put the exact interpretation on there as you will. So this is the gateway city where um, I fly into uh, and I have been leading trips to China, taking Americans to go hiking and learning about natural history and about national park management in China. Uh, for a couple of different entities, most recently, most currently, for the international travel company called Mountain Travel Sobek, or MT Sobek, which is based here in California. Um, in prior years, I led these trips for the nonprofit that I work for here in Yosemite, the Yosemite Conservancy. Most Americans have never heard of the city of Hangzhou. Uh, it's not as big as Beijing or Shanghai, but it is one of the giant multi-million people um, cities in China. Uh, and this, the way New York City is known for Central Park, Hangzhou is known for West Lake. 
It's a beautiful big lake, completely surrounded by parkland, and it's known to everybody in China the way everyone in the United States has heard of Central Park in New York. And it is a World Heritage Site. Uh, if you're not familiar with World Heritage Sites, this is something that's administered by UNESCO. A country can nominate some place that's important in their country, either for natural beauty or for cultural significance. And UNESCO admits a select number of sites around the world to the World Heritage Site list. Um, there are maybe around 900 World Heritage Sites around the world. And they include places like you know, the greatest hits of planet Earth. It would be the pyramids of Egypt. It's the Great Barrier Reef. It's the temple cities of Southeast Asia, the pyramids of Mesoamerica, um, the big game parks in East Africa. Um, so of 900 or so around the world in the United States and all the incredible things in our country, we have um, 21 or 22 World Heritage Sites. It's not that many. China now has caught up to the number one country in the world with the most World Heritage Sites. For many years, it's been Italy. And some of the World Heritage Sites are small. They're just a small church or a, a cathedral or a castle or something could be a World Heritage Site if it's significant in, in history. Uh, but now China has also got 55 World Heritage Sites, more than twice what we have in the United States. One of the World Heritage Sites of the six or so that we see on the itinerary I put together is West Lake. Uh, anyway, a beautiful parkland in the middle of um, a busy, noisy, dusty um, urban setting. Here's one of my uh, Sobek groups um, hiking in one of the mountain parks in China. This is not roughing it trips. This is very comfortable not deluxe luxury either, but very comfortable hotels and nice meals and um, very comfortable pace. But everybody on this trip has to be in good physical shape for the hiking that we're doing. And you'll see when we'll come to what I think of as the most incredible trails I've ever seen. So we're in good, um, like I say, good hotels and good restaurants and um, comfortable travel, not um, way out roughing it in the bush too, too much. Uh, here's our restaurant setup. We got the Lazy Susan in the middle of the table and the Wait staff keeps bringing more and more food or we'll have a buffet for dinner or for breakfast. We'll stop at a tea house in the evening before dinner and have tea on the edge of the lake and people eat what they want. There's lots of good food. It's kind of amazing, but in that country, they like Chinese food as much as we do. So we eat a lot of that, which is, uh, which I think is great. So here is Wang Shan. You can translate Wangshan very easily into Yellow Mountain. It was established in 1982, which is not that long ago relative to the earliest of America's national parks. We think of Yellowstone as the first national park in the world in 1872. And of course, here in Yosemite, we are proud to point out that Yellowstone copied what had been done in Yosemite National Park in California eight years before. So 1864, most historians consider the start of the, war, the national park movement in the world with the protection of Yosemite by the U.S. Congress and the signature of President Lincoln. So 1872 is Yellowstone, and we think of China as this ancient civilization that's been there for centuries and millennia, but their first national parks, really 1978, a couple of them, and then another wave in 1982 with Wang it's not very big, 59 square miles. Um, think of a seven mile by eight mile square. It's not that huge compared to Yosemite at 1,200 square miles or Yellowstone at more than 3,000 square miles. Or the biggest national park in the United States, most people have never heard of, but I know Dave and Aaron have, which is Wrangell St. Elias in Alaska, which is 21,000 square miles. You could take Wangshan and hide it there undetected. You could take Yosemite and hide it there for that matter. Wangshan ranges in elevation from 4,000 feet at the base to 6,000 feet at the top of the mountains. It's expensive to go there. It's uh, something that um, China's new uh, rich uh, class uh, goes to. It's a mark of status if you visit national parks. It's a thing to do like owning a foreign car and going on a foreign vacation and you visit national parks. But $25 per person a lot more expensive than the national parks in America, which might be $40, but that's a whole car full of people, and that's for seven days. 
uh, $25 if you want to come back the second day in a row, $25 again. A million and a half visitors, and that keeps going up. Uh, and the province is Anhui, which most people, most Americans have never heard of. It's a little bit inland, like I say, from the coast. And if you go one more province inland, then you are uh, in the province where uh, the city of uh, Wuhan is, where this viral outbreak started. So it's uh, sort of in that neighborhood. You go to the visitor center and like any good visitor center, here's a relief map. You can look around and see where things are. Here's our 59 square mile parcel. Um, you arrive down at the bottom of the mountains and the thing to do is to go up on top of the mountains and walk across the top of that map there. Um, and so that's what we do. And the way to get up on top of the mountains, no one drives, there's no road that brings you up onto the top. Uh, for the most part, you are walking up or if you look at this map with the straight blue lines, you're taking the cable car up to the top of the mountains, and then the black lines are the trails that connect the various um, parts of the top of this mountain range that you're going along. You also see comment? some buildings there. Go, go for it, yeah. Sorry, Dave. Um, I just wanted to let you know that you can use your pointer, I think. You can move your screen with the pointer, and it might work oh. for you on a PowerPoint. It does work. You know, I tried it earlier, and it didn't work, but now there it is. You have the magic touch. So uh, no, it's, yeah, So these blue lines are the cable cars and we can see some structures up here. These yellow squares with the roof on them are hotels. Again, there's no road, but there are hotels. Uh, we'll come back to that. The maps that they have in China, maps are not something that people study in school. Um, geography is not a big subject in Chinese schools. The way all of us took a, a geography class at some point in school and we learned about different kinds of maps, political maps, relief maps, physical maps. Um, so their maps are kind of cartoonish. Uh, I've been told too it's not legal for a foreigner to possess a topographic map for security reasons. So you get these kind of cartoon maps that aren't always super accurate or easy to read. And then like the whole planet except for our country and one or two others, they use the metric system in China. So here's Here's the way that um, I get to the top of the mountains is uh, the stairs and the stairs go on and on and on. In Yosemite, a lot of people dwell on the legendary 650 or so stairs of the Mist Trail. Uh, and here there are thousands and thousands and thousands of stairs on, like I say, the most incredible trails I've ever seen in all of my hiking. Um, notice the railing here and you notice the railing in all the trail pictures. Um, this is handmade and sculpted to look like it's wood. Uh, miles and miles of handrail, all artistically designed in different ways by different artists, essentially, to um, blend in with the scenery. And the stairs are granite. In some cases, they're concrete, but mostly granite blocks that have been hauled and put into place to make these phenomenal trails. Uh, David, you might recognize this as Morro Rock in Sequoia National Park. Uh, you know we see for Californians map. who've been to Morro Rock, the trails are sort of like that, but times uh, times 100. Sorry, was there another comment? What we were seeing was your map. Now all of a sudden your pictures are showing. Thank you. Okay, okay. So the stairs, the stairs that never end. Um, in the the picture on the lower left, you can see a little square thing on the very right edge of the photo near where my leg is going by. There's a there's a trash bin every hundred feet or so along these trails. Just a little um, simple bin on the ground, and there are crews of people up and down these trails every day, emptying the trash bins uh, every hour or so. Um, so they're really doing an impressive job trying to control litter. There are several cable cars and they're talking about building a new one uh, to get people to the top of the mountain who don't want to make the walk. Some people will start walking up the trail and get worn out. And so there's uh, one other way that you can finish your trip to the top. Believe it or not, there are crews of people who make their living carrying sedan chairs. Here is my friend Paul that I traveled on one of my trips with. Um, and the uh, sedan chair haulers let us hoist this uh, brave guy just for the fun of it. Uh, and it's kind of incredible, the trails that these guys go up and down um, to get people up to this hotel, for example, is one of the hotels on top of the mountain. 
and I don't know if I mentioned that there are a lot of people in China. Uh, this park, Wangshan, is known the way Americans know the Statue of Liberty or Mount Rushmore. It's a national icon, the landscape and the trees and the swirling clouds and the poetry and the literature and the artwork of this landscape are uh, really well known by everybody in China. And they all want to come here and they generally will ride the cable car and then they do one route across the top and then go down another cable car and that's their visit to Wangshan uh, in one day. Uh, it can get pretty busy at certain times in certain places. Underneath where I'm taking the photo, there's a food kiosk and so people are getting food and snacks and souvenirs and this is a prominent photo point. The whole place isn't like this. It is possible to get away from crowds, but you're gonna run into a lot of Chinese people here. The, the fun part of it is there are very few Westerners. So we sort of stood out and were our own tourist attraction. People wanted to take pictures with us just because we were unusual there. Um, a lot of people are going in an organized tour. They take a bus there from the city. They go up the cable car with the tour guide. The tour guide is carrying a red flag. You can see at the right, um, people are wearing the color-coded hats so they can see each other. The tour guide has a loudspeaker on their waist belt and a microphone uh, on their head. And uh, they're narrating as they go. And it's pretty obnoxious. Uh, at some point, they'll go to um, an earpiece set up so every visitor um, hears the tour guide, but not every other visitor hears the cacophony of the tour guides. And from everything I've gathered from what tour guides say, they're really very different than what a park ranger here would share. It's not very interpretive. It's very statistic based. So they will cite the height of the peaks or the number of the peaks or the depth of the lake or the square um, surface area of the lake. Um, they might recite a poem from history, but um, otherwise it's pretty matter of fact, um, just the stats rather than really an explanation and a story about the geology or a story about the kind of forest that grows there or identifying birds or anything like that. Uh, a different kind of delivery. This tradition, you may have seen this in other parts of the world, um, putting a padlock in a special place and ideally you and your beloved have got your names or initials engraved on there and this locking it in this place is to seal your love to lock your relationship in place so there are tens of thousands of padlocks uh, on the, the railings and the fences at Wangshan um, every so often the, the chain will break and they'll have to throw all these things out and put a new chain on there but uh, really an interesting uh, habit that I have seen a little bit of in Yosemite, but I hope it doesn't really catch on here. We don't really want to see this on the handrails at, at Zion or Grand Canyon, et cetera, I don't think. And the trail work includes these artistic little flourishes. There's no reason for this bridge, but it makes a good photo spot. So the trail crew built a little extra work into their um, simple navigation to add some some romance and some artistry and to show off their skills. But the real skills are um, to come. So here's the hotel where my group stays. This is the fancy hotel on top of the mountain of the um, 10 or 12 hotels that are up there. Again, there's no road to this hotel. There weren't trucks that brought up all of the supplies for the windows and the carpet and the tiles and the concrete blocks and the rebar and all the plumbing and the wiring and the light bulbs and dinner every night and lunch and breakfast and all the things that tourists need to have and to buy, all the toilets, all the beds, all the uh, cabinetry, et cetera, was not brought up by um, uh, a vehicle uh, on a road. Some of it may have been lifted by helicopters a small amount of it came up on cable cars, but most of it is brought up by porters. China has a vast pool of inexpensive labor and people carried most of this hotel up here. So you will still see porters while they're repairing or building something new, hauling building supplies up the mountain uh, by foot. And it's brutally hard work, it looks to me, but it's their living. It's how a lot of rural people make a living from tourism is by being porters on these uh, mountain trails. This hotel is fancy enough that comrade Deng Xiaoping stayed here in 1978 during the beginning of the great opening of China. 
to what we would call capitalism, but they call um, with some amusement uh, communism with a Chinese character. So if this hotel was fancy enough for Comrade Dong Xiaoping, the leader of the nation, to stay there, it was it's a pretty classy place. Here are porters. This guy's carrying somebody's luggage up to their hotel, and the guy on the right is carrying I don't know, 15, uh, it's probably more like 30 plus feet of rebar on his shoulder, following one of the yellow tour group companies up the trail. Uh, really hard work, but China has, like I say, a tremendous labor pool of um, low cost human capital to work. So it's an incredible thing to see that we just don't see in this country. And the landscape of Wangshan is truly unearthly. You have probably seen pictures of this national park in a Chinese restaurant, uh, a picture on the wall or even on the placemats, I've seen it. Um, and it looks surreal. I've seen it for years and I think that's fanciful fantasy landscape, but it really does look like it does in the artwork that you've seen in a Chinese restaurant. Like I say, everybody in China knows Wangshan the way we know Mount Rushmore. So the peak on the left is called uh, flower growing from a brush tip. Somebody saw that looking like the tip of a um, watercolor or ink brush. And there's a little flower on the top in that um, bush. And then the photo on the right, there's a whole Chinese epic legend about the travels of the monkey or the gold is monkey gazing at the West Sea. And it, looks not unlike a monkey looking off the top of that cliff. So this is something that fits in with uh, Chinese heritage is the story of the monkey's journey to the west with his, his companions. This one, if you remember the old days of Motorola, this is cell phone rock. And you've got the park administration with their helpful Consulting and Complaining Service Center. Not a place I'd want to work where people are coming in to complain. Uh, the, my friend, the liaison, told me the number one complaint in the park is it's too crowded. What can you do? Everybody wants to see it. The main reason for, and my groups, in my itinerary, we go up and we stay on the top uh, for three nights in two different hotels. The main reason for staying up on the top of the mountains is to get up early to watch the sunrise from one of these high points. And I have seen some truly world-class sunrises from the, the mountaintop at Wangshan. Uh, really a privilege to be in this unique place. And very, very often it's coming out of the sea of clouds below. Again, we're at 6,000 feet or so, not terribly high in altitude, um, but the climate there is such that um, the lowlands are moist and uh, the mist is it's a really lucky thing to get to be up there and to see this with just a small number of other visitors. Some of the viewing points get very crowded, but it's also really easy to get off to where you're by yourself to watch the sunrise. And then you're hiking across on these phenomenal trails that have been either hammered into the bedrock or uh, anchored to the bedrock. So you can go across places that are impossible to build a trail, places where we would not build a trail in this country. And you think, when do we get to go? When do we stop going up? But you don't. You keep going up and you keep going down. Uh, look at the stonework here. There's a stone handrail carved to fit your hand. And this, this gets called something that's like the stairway to the sky or the stairway to heaven. And uh, it really is something like that. But again, there are places where you can get away from the, the busy uh, flow of traffic and um, have a quiet moment for a picnic or a snack, um, take some pictures. This is um, one of my hiking groups from uh, a couple of years ago. If you ever saw that movie Avatar about the alien planet, um, James Cameron directing that. And one of the scenes, one of the settings is in the floating mountains. There's another national park that says, we're the park that inspired the floating mountains of Avatar. But really we know James Cameron came to Wangshan and he saw the clouds and the peaks sticking out and that inspired him with the science fiction idea of an alien planet um, with floating mountains. So we still get to see that at Wangshan National Park. 
with the strange blue alien creatures that inhabit it. There are strange creatures there, the monkeys. This is the, um, the stump-tailed macaque or Tibetan macaque, and they, they are interested in people and in snacks, and people love to take their pictures, and we do need to, it's, it's a critter we need to think about. The way in Yosemite or Yellowstone, you, you kind of have it in your mind. Watch out for the bears. Don't let the bears get your food. And here and there are helpful signs. Um, this one says, attention to the monkeys. Please do not feed and play them. We know what they're trying to say. So here's more impossible terrain looking down in the canyons and the slopes of uh, Wangshan. Again, places completely inaccessible, except there's a trail that goes down into this gorge. Here again is some of this handmade handrail. It's concrete with a uh, small gauge rebar inside, but then painted and touched up to look like bark. Um, just amazing labor that went into building these trails. Another inaccessible canyon. Nobody could ever get down there. It would be so dangerous, but you get on the trail and off you go. Um, and this one here, look at the handrail here. They made it look like vines. But that is uh, concrete with rebar inside it. Um, and you have an option. You can go up this way and over to here and down on the other side of that slab, or you can follow down this trail and they join below. Simply breathtaking. Here you can see everybody is hugging the inside of this trail because this goes down for three or four hundred feet below and, uh, and above this trail, another three or four hundred feet up to the top of the cliff. Why build a trail here? It's hard to say. It's really the one way to get between two points, but um, it's as if the engineers challenged themselves and each other to... Here is a vertical wall. I bet you can't build a trail across that, and sure enough, they do. Really well engineered, very solid. It doesn't feel the least bit rickety, but it's in an impossible location where there, people are not meant to walk there. Uh, hanging on tightly, looking down at great uh, depth below off these phenomenal trails. Here's a little bit of the artwork of Wang Shan's landscape that again, I think you've probably seen in a Chinese restaurant somewhere. Uh, and again, artistic bridges, tremendous amount of stonework. I mean, look at that pillar on the right to put this, hold this stairway in place, and a lot of space below. This is called the Ferry Walking Bridge and they had to cut a tunnel to build a bridge to cut another tunnel through the solid rock so you can get to a place where you can view, uh, look back at the ferry walking bridge. And this does connect to another trail that goes down. Um, very wow. few people make it to this destination, but it's um, just, just hard to believe. Pete, can you talk a little bit about earthquakes? This part of China is pretty stable. Uh, when we come to our other national park, earthquakes are a real issue there. So when you come to that part, but this is a very small mountain range. It's granite the same way Yosemite is. Rather than a batholith, this is more small body of granite. So we would call it a lacolith. Like Yosemite, it's fairly young granite, uh, uh, relatively young. It's Cretaceous like Yosemite's is. And the uplift is fairly recent, a little bit older Yosemite maybe 20 million years instead of 10 or less. But look at this trail that goes right across this. This is an old trail, it's abandoned. It just kind of stops right here. But this one is made of wooden planks um, anchored into the boulders and it's uh, kind of exciting that it's still there. Uh, but then look at this big cliff up here. There, There's a trail going across this pillar here um, and uh, this other trail coming down to the bottom there. So ridiculous, absurd terrain that they've made accessible with uh, phenomenal trail engineering. All that belong to the nation belong to the world. Civilization is the most important. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it's nice. No littering. So now it's time to head out of Wangshan and its incredible trails and handrails uh, to the low country around, very rural, very um, relatively poor compared to the, the wealth we think of of Shanghai or Guangzhou. Uh, but because it's close by, there's another World Heritage Site, which is the historic village of Hongsun, uh, which has got houses that go back several hundred years. And it's a well-known place in China. A lot of artists come here to paint the old architecture. It's very little changed in 
really hundreds of years, people still live in this village and still farm the fields outside. It's famous for the canals that run under the streets and this central uh, pond that is shaped like a half moon. So that's the half moon pond. And um, we just make a short visit there and stop and have lunch in a really, really old, old restaurant um, up at the top of the village, which is fun to see the architecture and art students. All these people on the pond are art students who come from all over the country to paint at uh, Hong Sun. Some of the houses you can go into if there's not a family that lives there. Um, some of them have little shops where they're selling uh, snacks and that kind of thing. Um, but pretty neat to see an old village. And then this is not in that old village, but just more fun Chinese English. I, I didn't try it, but I was really tempted to see how, how tasty the salty pea brain was. I don't know what that's like. And then this is the other one. I'm so sorry that her strap of her, her shirt there, but they tried to translate English and they got an error message, but they printed that anyway. Oh well, you never know what you'll see while you're traveling. And here it is in several languages in uh, Mandarin and English and Korean and Japanese. Go ahead for visiting. Street food. I, I do like Chinese food and I love eating the street food. You never know exactly what you'll find, but there's so much that is so uh, yummy and tasty and, um, and I think safe. I never had a, I've never been sick from eating the food in China. You've heard of the terracotta warriors. They have terracotta policemen there too. Keep an eye on the traffic there. And windy mountain roads. Um, we did our traveling by uh, on our own bus. I have been on Chinese public buses as well as on the train and um, I think all their transportation is really quite good. Growing numbers of people that um, own cars, um, foreign cars and more and more cars being manufactured in China as well. And look at this exotic vegetable. Uh, here's something that comes from the New World and we find it way off in the really the, the small scale hinterlands of um, Western China. They're boiling up corn on the cob, which comes from Mexico originally. And more fun English. When on fire, please don't use the lift, meaning the elevator. And that green sign, that's Sorry to say it's right, at, uh, right above a urinal. Again, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by this one, but it's nice. Equal splendor. That sounds like a good thing. In an airport of all things. And more good street food, uh, like an empanada kind of a thing and some pot stickers and uh, it is really fun. Here's an outdoor shopping mall. Uh, if you've got good eyes, you'll see Coca-Cola advertised. You'll see that Scottish restaurant right here in the middle that we all, we all like. Uh, and um, lots of young people going shopping. Um, and who knows what kind of fun things there'll be to buy. Again, there's a cachet with, uh, with American stuff, so they'll make up some things. Fantastic Fairyland, I don't know what that means. Air Force New York, make music not pleasure. I don't know. And Starbucks, you can definitely find your Starbucks coffee. If you're not sure what to buy, the merchants will have some helpful suggestions here. Maybe try this jewelry might be nice. Look at all the stuff she's carrying to sell. Um, but it's simple to just learn the, the phrase for no thanks, I'm not interested in it won't bother you too much. Uh, more fun English train tickets. Thought about trying to buy a train ticket. And then caution falling into water. Is that advising you to do that or don't fall into the water? I don't know. Uh, more signs that I really liked. That may bring inconvenience to you. Sorry. Also that one in the lower left with the bright red stripe, that is in the men's room. Oops. 
I don't know how they know where you're standing anyway. So now we're going to travel across to the interior of the country uh, to our, our next national park in the province of Sichuan through the central, the big city of Chengdu is what we're flying to. And really that is equivalent to Denver. It's the big city in the western interior of China until you go off into the Tibetan plateau and the, the Tibetan province in the vast high cold desert areas. Um, yeah. So this park doesn't usually get translated into English. People usually are saying that the Chinese Ju Zhai Go, which some people find is easy to remember, sounds like G.I. Joe. But Ju Zhai Go means Valley of the Nine Villages. It was established as a protected area in 1984. A little bit bigger than Wangshan at 278 square miles. And here the base of the mountains is at 6,000 feet and the mountains go up to 15,000 feet. And in contrast to Wangshan, where we do our visiting by going to the top of the mountains and traveling across there, here we're at the bottom of the mountains. We're down in the valleys, looking up at the high peaks. So we just stay in the bottom of the, the valley. Also expensive to um, enter. Um, incredible for a remote area, but because of the cachet of the Nouveau Riche visiting national parks, um, three million visitors a day, almost everybody goes there only one day. And only one day in their life do they go to Jujago. It's not a thing like if you live in Durango, you're going to Mesa Verde every so often. If you live in Flagstaff, you're going to Grand Canyon every so often. Or if you live in San Francisco, you may have grown up going to Yosemite every year. But at Jujago, uh, it's so remote. Nobody really does that. And no one really goes back day two, day three, day four. In this one, there's no accommodation within the park. So you're staying at a gateway town outside Jujago and going in by bus. Here's the map with the, the gateway town at the bottom. Uh, you've got about a two hour drive from the airport, uh, a big airport that takes uh, air traffic from all over the country. And at the entrance of the park, you get on a bus and go up the, the two um, valleys on either side here. Um, and the main feature you're looking at at Jujai Go, besides looking up at the mountains, you're looking at the water. Uh, the streams and the waterfalls are the spectacle to see at Jujai Go. I don't know how well that color comes across, but it is surreal. It is as if they have poured some kind of dye or tidy bowl into the, the lakes and ponds. All different colors. Here the geology is limestone, uh, karst, a fairly young karst topography. So there, are, there aren't caverns, at least that have a surface access, but this is limestone and a slight dissolved amount of um, calcite in the water adds um, nice um, color to the lakes and streams. And then uniquely structured waterfalls where that calcite builds up these barriers and travertine pools and it builds up on tree roots and rocks and logs, and you have um, really surprising shapes of waterfalls. Yosemite is famous for its waterfalls too, but um, they're uniquely different structures in Jujago. Here's a lake with incredible clarity and color, and there's no stream coming out of this valley. Um, there's no stream that comes into this lake but the lake is kept filled by a subterranean stream. So it's very clean. There's no silt, there are no pine needles, there's no flood debris washed into this lake. It helps keep the water clarity um, quite good. And many of the lakes are this way, that they don't have a surface stream flowing in or out. It's all subterranean. And you can see coniferous forests like you would see in our high mountains here. It's a chilly place with just a little bit of deciduous vegetation. Here's one of those unique waterfalls. It started off as a a travertine barrier and just built up and built up and there's forest all across the top through this stream um, and the buildup of calcium carbonate keeps the water flowing in different places over time but really unusual shapes to the waterfalls. Culturally this area is Tibet. It's not technically the province or the nation of Tibet, it's the province of Sichuan, but the people who live there aboriginally are Tibetan people. This is the flag of Tibet, and it is illegal to have this flag in China. So I like to show it here to show the, the strength of the Tibetan identity is still there, 
despite the fact that the Han Chinese, the dominant culture of uh, the nation of China, have uh, increasingly taken over Tibetan parts of, um, of China and, and Tibet itself. But still there, and there's, of the nine villages in the park, um, six of them are still lived in. Uh, some of the others have been abandoned or only used um, during the summertime by some families. Besides the Tibetan culture, there's another minority culture in this part of the country. It's a very small group called Chang. Uh, and this is in Ch uh, Chang architecture in a um, um, village. It's very different from anything you would see in the U.S. It's just fun to look at just people's houses and people's shops. So the shop is downstairs and the house is upstairs. In earlier days, it may have been that they had goats or sheep or yaks. Uh, these people are yak herders um, downstairs and the family li lived upstairs. But now it's uh, commerce with tourists. Pete, hey, is space for a question? Uh, hmm? You bet. Uh, just a confirmation. You said in your original, your opening slide for the park, you mentioned 3 million people. Is that per day or per year? Because you were saying it was so remote. And where are they coming from? Yeah, per year. Uh, per year. And these are people, most of China's population is all is along the coast. That's where the great bulk of the Chinese population is, where you find Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing, um, and where you find especially the great uh, export factories, um, where all of the, this productivity of uh, Chinese growth has happened is along the coast. And so the visitors are people that now have money because of um, China's connection to global trade um, export. and. Um, um, they will go on a vacation. They'll have a week or two of vacation every year, and these people come and they s have heard they're supposed to go and see a national park. They've heard of Zhuzhai Go, and they go on a vacation with a tour company that they um, go through. There are people who do travel independently, but the great bulk of them go on a package tour that gets them from place to place to place and guides them around. And so a lot of these visitors, they're not outdoors people, they're not naturalists or photographers, they're a guy that works in a factory and all he sees is gray skies and gray city. Um, and to come to a place like this is a, another planet and very, very exciting and very inspiring for people to see this in their city clothes. They, they don't shop at REI, they're not wearing hiking clothes or things like that, but um, they are awestruck by the landscape, which is kind of cool to see. So they come in by high speed rail, they come in by air, um, they're on a bus, they're with a, a guide that gets them to their hotel and to the dinner buffet, et cetera. So this is in one of the Tibetan villages. Um, this uh, the guide that we worked with knew some of the families there who invited us in for tea, which was really neat to learn a little bit about the it's a brightly colored Tibetan home. Uh, and then this is one of the park rangers, uh, Jack Lee, who spent a couple days um, with my group and um, really uh, his English was pretty good. Uh, he was a, a great guy to work with. So there's another one of my American groups. The trails go are different than Wangshan. They're not going across high mountain exposures, but um, there must be maybe 25 miles of trail developed in Zhuzhai Go, and every single inch of it is boardwalk. 25 miles of boardwalk to keep you off the ground, off the mud, off the vegetation, getting across streams and that type of thing. Unbelievable, again, engineering effort to put this infrastructure into an otherwise pretty remote mountain valleys. So you almost never are walking on, on dirt or rocks. These peaks go up to 14, 15,000 feet. Um, a lot of the peaks don't have names. They've never been climbed. Tourists don't go up there. There's no tradition of backpacking or camping. Um, it's something to look at in the distance, and, but not go to. Um, whereas if this was in Rocky Mountain National Park, people would be climbing those peaks. There'd be a guidebook about the um, rating the climbs and telling you what equipment and what the routing is, but that's, this has not developed in China yet. 
again, most people here, they ride a bus into the park, they get off, they take a picture at the lake, they get on the bus, it takes them to the next place, they get off, take a picture of the waterfall. Some places they'll walk between these attractions that are closed, but mostly the boardwalk areas are pretty empty and you can get away from the crowds um, pretty easily as usually I go uh, where the bus gets people around and you'll see things like this that there's no crowd of tourists that gets to see this view of this particular lake. I can't remember the name of this lake but I think it's something to do with the tiger. They have a tiger lake, a rhinoceros lake even though there's no history of rhinoceri um, in this bioregion, but there's some myth or some story. They have uh, larch trees, uh, Chinese larch that uh, turns color in the fall, which is really nice. Chujago is known for fall colors. This was a side valley off the main valley that no visitors go to except because of Yosemite's relationship with Jujago. The rangers suggested this and we did something really unique. We actually went cam camping up in this side valley I was amazed as we started up, it goes in seven or eight miles on a, on a dead end road and seeing this stream here, that's got a pale blue milkiness to it. And I said to one of the rangers, there, there must be a glacier up here because this looks like glacial flow in this water. And his answer was, we think so. We think so. What do you, you think you have a glacier at the top of your park, but you don't really know. That is amazing to me that the wilderness within the park boundary is uh, not fully explored. So we had a real privilege of getting up this side valley and getting to um, camp. Here's our tent set up. And this is almost my favorite part of the, my time in China is being in a remote wild place. There's no lights, there's no buses, there's no traffic, no urban. It was um, dark and quiet at night. In the morning, getting up and going, uh, bird watching and we saw, I can't remember, four or five different species of chickadees. Sichuan is a biological hotspot with a tremendous diversity of flora and fauna. So to see four species of different kinds of chickadees uh, was really exciting in this uh, camp. Jujigo occasionally has pandas. Um, the pandas move they're always there, reliable, but um, it's exciting to think that maybe we'd find a panda track or something like that. So while we camped in these tents here, we had our meals in the ranger cabin that's up in the top of this valley, which is um, pretty fun. Nearby uh, Jujigo National Park is Huang Long, which is another World Heritage Site, so we make a short day trip over there. And this again is a place where the water features are really neat. And the tourists are friendly and excited to see some some Westerners. So they, these nice people with the funny fern tourist hats absolutely get posed with some Americans uh, for a tourist photo. And it's sort of funny to be part of somebody's story of their visit. We saw some Americans. Uh, again, travertine deposits in Wong Wong, uh, also at the edge of the Tibetan Plateau there. Pete, before you left that park, did um, you guys see some other mammals, uh, reptiles other than birds, or was there big wildlife presence? So the only time that I have been uh, to China is in the fall. Uh, so the birds aren't very active. Um, in different places, there aren't even that many insects in the higher, colder mountains as the foliage is changing. Um, didn't see any panda bears in the wild. Um, but I'm coming back to panda bears. The one thing we did see, we saw um, uh, on a couple of my visits to um, Jujigo, have seen the, something called the yellow fronted marten, a kind of a weasel. It's much bigger than our marten. It's more wolverine sized, just not as bulky. Um, but I've seen those a couple of times. It looks maybe more like a, a raccoon, but not stripy like a raccoon. Um, there's one species of fish in the water at Jujigo. It's a scaleless fish that's evolved in isolation. Um, I don't remember seeing anything else at Jujigo uh, mammal-wise. Um, even, even, even in the lower elevations where you'd expect to see squirrels and rabbits, you don't. And um, it's hard to explain why that is. I hate to think of it, but one, thing is the Chinese people really like to eat everything. And they're kind of proud of that. They will say, Chinese people, we eat everything that has legs except tables and chairs. Uh, so I, it wouldn't be surprising if um, 
even as weird as it sounds, if rangers or locals are setting traps for squirrels, um, is why you just don't see a lot of squirrels. Or when you do see a squirrel in a city park, people are chasing it around, taking its photo and wanting to feed it. It's uh, really unusual to see wildlife. So to get to a place like Jijago and see something that is a, a predator slash scavenger, the yellow-fronted martin was kind of cool, a kind of indication of, um, of good health of the ecosystem there. But yeah, birds be the main thing. Uh, so Wang Long, this, um, uh, coming back to Zhizhai Go and Wang Long, these mountains here, the edge of the Tibetan plateau, this is much more seismically active where the Indian subcontinent is still pushing up into Asia and driving up the Himalaya and the Tibetan plateau is still uplifting. So the dramatic geography is new and, and active. And Jujai Go suffered an earthquake where the epicenter was really right under the park two, almost three years ago now, um, that was uh, a 6.5, but right there that did a lot of damage to the infrastructure of the park, the roads, the buildings, there were, depending on your sources, roughly 50 people were killed. A uh, few hundred were injured, including a lot of tourists and some foreign tourists were injured in collapsing buildings uh, in the Gateway Hotels primarily. This um, happened early in the morning. Um, very, very destructive. And some of the features, some of the streams, there were, uh, hundreds and hundreds of rock falls in this area of the mountains and landslides caused by this earthquake. So when I was there in China in September, the park was still closed. They're still repairing infrastructure to allow people to visit. Uh, Wang Long, same thing. The damage is a little bit less because it's a few miles further away, but Zhuzhai Go suffered quite a lot of damage from that, uh, that earthquake. And uh, they're still repairing it. So I'm very eager to get back there. Um, I do have, a, a, technically I have another trip on the calendar for September, but realistically there's no way that that's gonna happen. So I hope to go next May, and I'm very eager to see um, the, what's left of the damage and how the administration of the park has repaired that. But I've been staying in touch with my liaison at Jujai Go, who has described some of the damage. Um, so I'm very sad that I was not able to go there on my last visit last fall. So instead, we came up with a different itinerary for my group and went and saw some other well-known attractions in Sichuan province. This is the giant Buddha of Lashan, 233 feet tall, carved out of pink sandstone. It's a phenomenal piece of artwork and history. This is also part of a World Heritage Site. Um, first seen from the river down below, and then you can hike up these trails and be eye to eye with the Buddha here. This is me. You can hike down to the bottom and look up at this Buddha. 233 feet above. It's an astonishing thing. The first time I saw it, I was awestruck. Uh, Hermé Shan, one of the places where uh, Taoism was um, started, and lots of people go here just to hike the beautiful mountain trails, but a lot of Taoists go for pilgrimages and making offerings in the temples. It's really an interesting combination of recreation place and a sacred site. Um, so really interesting to go and see the temples that are still uh, revered and very much uh, in use. And Erme also has, uh, has the same stump-tailed macaque, a different subspecies, but they are um, something you have to be a little bit careful about. Um, you don't want to be a target of the local monkey gangs and number five, especially, keep clam. Keep clam when monkeys get into your way. Uh, and to be honest, they are a little scary. They know how to work tourists. They'll sort of bluff charge you and make you um, throw some food just so that they will leave you alone. Um, we saw one guy who had food in a plastic grocery bag, had snacks, wasn't feeding the monkey, but the monkey climbed right up on him and tries to grab this bag out of his hand and end up ripping the guy's jacket. It was a little scary. So when you are there, you just make sure that your backpack is closed. You're not carrying anything in your hands and um, stay, stay together in a group so the monkey gangs don't uh, shake you down. 
uh, Ching Chung, another um, mountain with uh, sacred roots in Buddhism. And uh, here we are, this you just wouldn't see in a national park in the United States. Here's a college, a group of college students on their um, autumn holiday, and they are singing patriotic songs at the entrance of the park where you buy your entrance ticket and start your walk. Um, really kind of interesting, different thing. And they gave all of us Chinese flags to uh, carry and wave, which was uh, just something that we haven't seen in our parks here yet. Again, a lot of temples. Uh, there's also a cable car that will get people up, but uh, really fun walking. Here, the weather was such that um, we did not go up to the summit of uh, Qingsheng, but um, too, too dangerous, too cold and icy. Uh, but down at lower elevations, we had fun with uh, some insect life, uh, praying mantis and this giant black butterfly. This isn't a butterfly park. It was just an area that had some vegetation that was good for butterflies in the autumn. And this, that butterfly, for whatever reason, is called a great Mormon, like uh, Latter-day Saints, a great Mormon. Do not parabolize. Uh, and it, it's good. It has the, the symbol. Don't. Don't throw trash over the side of the fence. Do not parabolize. And of course, because they're in that area, we go to, I've been to several different panda reserves, which are fascinating places where the government has been uh, breeding and studying pandas and um, raising them for hopefully release to the wild. But in, to this point, mostly they are being released into zoos in other parts of China or in other parts of the world. The whole business of panda diplomacy is really quite something where um, we have pandas in the United States at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. and the San Diego Zoo and maybe one other, maybe the Atlanta Zoo. Uh, that's wonderful kind of diplomacy um, between China and the United States and uh, the pandas are great ambassadors that way. They are as photogenic as you would imagine and with, uh, again, some of the, the people that have a connection with Yosemite, because these panda reserves are connected to the National Park Administration, which is connected to Yosemite. So we've gotten in to see the little baby pandas that are just little tiny, so, so cute, like chunky squirrels, and the teenage pandas that are wrestling with each other. They are really charismatic uh, fauna. That sign at the lower right says, I am responsible for being cute. You are responsible for being quiet. Nice messaging. Uh, some of the panda reserves, if you make an extra donation to their research and conservation efforts, they will let you go in with the pandas to get photographed and uh, give you a carrot to feed the critter. And uh, it's pretty, pretty neat to be that close to them uh, while they're distracted with a the carrot. They do have real serious teeth and, and claws. Um, so uh, one of my uh, participants got a little souvenir to take home, a little uh, skin tattoo uh, from a panda encounter. Nothing malicious, it was just the panda reaching for the carrot and his hand was uh, in the way. Here's the closest I've gotten to the pandas myself. Uh, and then some photoshopping. They really are not kiss pandas as fun as that would be. Uh, China we see in the news all the time with trade disputes that are actually pretty intense and pretty serious and uh, not that much fun. I don't think the, the trade disputes, there's worry about the, the giant corporation uh, in China, which is a pretty highly regarded um, kind of a national treasure corporation, Huawei, uh, building the 5G cell network. They've got more equipment and more know-how than uh, any other country corporations for building the, the next generation of cell phone uh, communications. We've got a space race competition with uh, Chinese uh, getting better and better with um, putting people in space and putting their rovers on the moon. Uh, we've got this whole fear about the source of the, the coronavirus that's messing with our economy and the world economy so much. We've got competition in the South China Sea between our allies, uh, the Philippines. We've got to worry about uh, Taiwan and its uh, autonomy versus being, uh, will it eventually be absorbed by communist China? 
we've got uh, tension in Hong Kong about their freedom and independence um, versus being managed by Beijing. Um, so there's a lot of things that make uh, us worried about China as a competitor or a threat. But despite all that, there are some wonderful things that we share with China. And I think one of the things we're proudest of in this country is the, the national park idea that started here. That was this, an idea of American citizens that has since spread around the world. Every country there is has some kind of national park. Uh, again, the idea which started in, in Yosemite in California. Uh, China is very proud, increasingly proud of their national parks, and they're very eager to learn from how we do things here. Um, despite the antiquity of their civilization, um, we, they have a lot more to learn from us than we have to learn from them about managing national parks. But still, so much in common, uh, the overlap, we completely ignore the trade disputes, the military tensions, the source of the virus, What's important is protecting our national parks and making them accessible to the people of our countries and the people of our worlds, especially in the case of these World Heritage Sites, which are the sister parks of uh, Yosemite. So here is our liaison, uh, Janet, or Yutsen, uh, visiting Hetch Hetchy uh, in Yosemite a few years ago. Um, and here I am with her last fall, uh, visiting her national park again. Um, just a wonderful relationship that doesn't have any of the political overtones other than we love our parks. We feel privileged to be in a position where we get to care for them and welcome the people of, of the world, like I say, to come and see them and experience them. So these exchanges of personnel have been really wonderful. Uh, here are two rangers from Jujago uh, visiting Yosemite about 10 years ago. These two were here about, um, gosh, I can't remember, a month or two, learning from various parts of Yosemite's National uh, Administration on how we do things here. This woman on the left, Ching Sha, is a Tibetan who grew up in one of the villages in Jujago, and her job in the National Park is as a liaison between the Tibetan villagers who live in the park and the park administration. So she is part of the dialogue of the indigenous people with uh, park management. And one of the things that was thrilling uh, to bring her to the visitor center and to our Indian museum next to the visitor center in Yosemite Village, where she got to meet with two of Yosemite's local Indians um, in, the, in the center and see what they do to interpret the um, Native American heritage of Yosemite to visitors. So this is in the museum where Ben and Julia uh, have the job of interpreting their culture to modern visitors. And Ching Chao was fascinated by this and brought the idea back to her home park of Jujago and got Tibetan ladies from her village to set up their looms for weaving in the visitor center as a way to talk about Tibetan culture to park visitors in Jujago. So that was a neat direct outcome of uh, the visitor, the exchange of staff to bring um, rangers from China to meet rangers from the United States. Ben and, and Julia in the middle there are both National Park Service employees uh, and both uh, local Native Americans. So there are a lot of similarities to despite the differences between Chinese people and American people. Most of us live in or near a city. We don't like to be in traffic, but we do it if we have to. We like our Starbucks and our uh, Big Macs, uh, and we like to pose for fancy weddings and fancy wedding clothes. Um, a lot of commonalities, despite the differences. Um, we have different visions, different versions of national park visits. Uh, here's the trail crew in China building some of those fancy artistic uh, handrails. Here's a campground outside the hotel, one of the hotels in the national park at Wangshan. They are just jammed in cheek by jowl. The ground underneath them is not dirt or pine needles. It's just um, granite tiling. Um, but that's where they camp for the night and pack up the next day and continue on their hike. Here's some guys with big bags of recycling on a tricycle. Here's the buffet in the hotel. Here's the park managers uh, with me. Here's the nice hotel in the park. So some similarities and differences at the same time between us and Chinese people. Um, we like to take our pictures. We like to meet other people. Um, 
even without any language in common, the smile uh, is something that always works. This cute little kid I met on the high speed train was just, um, I don't know if he was scared of me or surprised at me, but um, it was pretty neat to have no language, but be able to communicate with that family. And of course, our the rangers um, in the lower left, those two guys in the green jackets are rangers at Jujago. Um, they care about their job and their park as much as our rangers do. That is completely in common and uh, very solid despite the cultural differences. Um, pretty impressive to see how dedicated they are to the stewardships of their parks. The Chinese people and the park administration see the sacred in the landscape, that the beautiful is worth protecting. Um, that lower right photo is Yosemite and there's a, one of the temples in Jijago. And this is something we would say in our parks as much as the Chinese people would say too, the green mountains and waters are invaluable treasures. Uh, very um, easy to understand that the sacred, that the beautiful is sacred in its own way. So that's Yosemite on the left. And uh, one of the high passes at uh, uh, 12,000 feet or so between Jujago and Huanglong with lots of Tibetan prayer flags. The commonalities, the solidarity of the national parks in both places really came home to me when I saw this sign and uh, this put it all together. This made me feel very much of, of a piece with the Chinese uh, Park Administration in this great quote from John Muir that it is all connected. It's all attached. That's all we need to remember um, for sharing the commonalities with uh, people in a foreign, foreign country. So that is my program and I would love to take your questions if people have any questions or what I really want to do is see um, people's comments so I'm not I can get them to you Pete sure the best way okay is to see what people have either seen in China was their favorite thing or um, if they have a, a reason that they really want to go to China yeah so okay. we've, got, uh, yeah. we've got one visitor Heather they visited Beijing in 2012 got it Ed went to north face of uh, Mount Everest in 1990 and wow. Elaine has never been, but uh, was looking forward to this vicarious trip with you this evening. Super. And, um, what I would like to say just before we get into your quick Q&A and for other comments from folks is that uh, I wanted to thank you so much for um, putting this together and sharing your wisdom and your insight and being part of this process. It was really great to have you here. And I wanted to apologize for not doing the introduction. So I guess now I could do the outro -duction. No, no, it's got to come. Because what uh, I would have said is that what you're going to see this evening is a fantastic naturalist, an amazing presenter, really knowledgeable individual, and probably one of the funniest guys I've ever seen on stage. But now they've all seen that. So I don't really need to do that. But just to um, put it out there, thank you so much again. It was really great to see your images and uh, super yeah. double thumbs up. So. Much appreciated. Thank and you, David. That, um, do you want folks to uh, just kind of unmute themselves and ask you questions out loud? That might be an easy Hey, that would be great. Let's try that. Yeah, sounds good. So folks, again, in the bottom, you know, you just hover over that screen. You can unmute when you have a question and uh, then just mute yourself back up when you're, um, when you're done. So you're on. Okay. Hey, that was a great presentation. Um, we, we're uh, David's mom, and uh, I'm with David's mom. And uh, Terrific. I, I look forward to going to China, and I got to tell you that was, those two national parks are beautiful. And they you are did a marvelous stunning. Job. Yeah, it's been a privilege to take people to see these places. I think most people are pretty blown away by the landscapes. I know I was when I first heard that Yosemite had sister national parks in China when this was established in 2006. I thought. You know, they'll be nice, but they won't be as good as Yosemite. And again, they're not as big, but they are astonishing landscapes. And so really it's been a privilege to, to take people there um, and see the, the number of connections that are between Yosemite and China with a granite mountain range, with uh, beautiful waterfalls, with rangers that care so much about their parks. Uh, John Muir went to China. Most people don't know that, but uh, he didn't get to see our sister parks. 
Um, but he went to China when he was in his later years. He just came into three different parts of China on the coast while he was on pretty much an around the, the world tour in 1904, 1905. Um, just after he met with President Roosevelt, he traveled to Europe and across uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad and um, visited China briefly. He was mostly interested in botany and geology, but I bet he wished he could see our sister national parks. Well, yeah. we're, on, we're on a tour right now for 28 days, trying to cover as many parks as possible. And tomorrow will be Grand Teton and then Yellowstone. But after we saw the Escalante and the uh, Bear's Ear, I, I don't know what can top those two. Oh, fantastic. Did you, <laughs> I'm sure you got to Mesa Verde while you were visiting Dave and Aaron. Yes, we did that about a year and a half ago. Okay, I was a ranger at Mesa Verde some time ago and um, what a fantastic place. Yeah, it is, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation, we really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Anybody else, any other questions about China or parks? Pete, um, I'm not sure if you've got your chat open, I just wanted to relay some of the things that folks have been uh, sharing in the chat. I'm seeing it actually, yeah. Okay, good. This, this, very, I appreciate the compliments. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, one thing I should mention um, that I didn't, in, in terms of management, uh, here in the U.S., all of our national parks are managed by the National Park Service. One agency based in Washington, D.C. The rangers wear the same uniforms. They have the same guidelines and rules um, that standardize the stewardship of our national parks and the care of visitors to national parks. China does not have that. There is no headquarters for national parks in Beijing. Every one is locally managed and they're managed differently and for different values. Um, they don't have the same uniform, they don't have the same rules, they don't have the same uh, heritage that our national park rangers do. But now they are starting a system of national park management and they're gonna be creating some new national parks with this new um, system. So they're in the process of changing how they have traditionally managed national parks to unifying that uh, under one um, directorate. So that'll be interesting to see over the next uh, five or ten years how that evolves. The people at Wangshan and Zhujiago really don't know exactly how it's going to happen, that they will soon become under uh, national management where to this point they've been more locally managed. They're also managed to a great deal to bring in the visitors to get those gate receipts is a huge important part of the local economy. Um, so they have that different directive than what our National Park Service has where the focus is not so much bring in as many as we can, make as much money as we can. It's not like Disneyland where the more, the more boots on the trail, the more money for us. The, our National Park Service doesn't work that way. Um, but in China, it has been to this point. Um, so it'll be interesting to see that evolve. And again, they're trying, they have sent so many delegations to the United States to learn from us in all of our national parks, how the National Park Service does things, who gets to make decisions, what the regulations are, and it's, they're making Chinese knockoffs of our Code of Federal Regulations for national parks, it's really interesting. And yeah, I would love to get more into the Tibetan region and see Lhasa, that would really be something else. Or to see the north side of Everest, that would be impressive. It's a big country uh, like the United States is. And like I say, the western third of China is really the empty quarter. Very challenging landscape, high and dry. Any other questions? Heather's got a question. Uh, hi, Pete. Um, I was really, it was kind of fascinating when you said how many trash cans there were along the trail and that there were people, um, you know, emptying them every hour. Whereas in our parks, we don't put trash cans many, you know, we want people to take their trash with them. And uh, yet I've, I've worked, you know, in a, in a local park before and people leave trash anyway, you know, so it, it can be quite messy and a lot of volunteer groups come in and clean up. But um, what, when, when the Chinese Rangers have come over 
have they made any comments or noticed why don't you have trash bins or people to pick up the trash you know that is a good question i don't remember talking about that with the chinese ranger staff in yosemite um that is a good question um to be honest they were very um much in the mode of absorbing what we do here rather than questioning it or they were very interested in the hierarchies who decides things what's the structure of park management where what are the regulations that govern whether or not you can build a new parking lot or build a new hotel whose decision is that they don't have the same structure here uh, it's obviously right. It's the Chinese, it's the Communist Party that runs those parks, but it's the local party managers that, that um, make the decisions there. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't recall. The next set of rangers that come, I'm going to ask them, try to really get them to open up. Tell us really, what do you think of Yosemite and how we do things here? How crazy is it that we don't have a trash can every 100 feet <laughs> and we don't have a crew? Of, um, of laborers cleaning these things up all the time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, yeah. for your presentation. It's been fabulous. Um, My pleasure. Really, really appreciate it. Great. Any others? And that's okay. If you think of another question in five minutes or tomorrow, ask Dave and he can relay it to me. That would be thank fine. You. Hey Pete, future future trips. I, I typed in the chat, but I assume this year is not looking good. But do you oh. have future departures planned? Pablo, yes. Well, technically I still have a September trip on the calendar, but I don't think that's realistic at all. Um uh so next May is the next one I have on the calendar after this, and I'm really hopeful to um get to um go then. So next May and next September of 2021, that I cannot wait spring, to get back. Hmm? That would that would be your first spring visit to these parts. Yeah, park. yeah, I'd be really excited to see what it's like when the birds are really all singing and nesting, and um, when all the flowers are in bloom. I think that'll be amazing. Maybe more fresh snow in the high peaks. That'll be different. So yeah, I can't wait to get back over there and keep up this link between Yosemite and our siblings. Again, if somebody else has a question or a thought, you can email it to David and he can email it to me. And I was just going to say that, um, you know, thinking about the fact that this is, you're, you're cultivating a relationship between, you know, national parks of two countries that are a little edgy right now so far as relationships go and I can think of no better individual to foster that relationship and develop it in a way yeah. that yeah uh, you know beneficial for both parks and hopefully that could kind of ripple out into some sort of local you know beneficial effort so I appreciate what you're doing and, and feel um, that it's in good hands oh uh, well thanks David thanks that's uh it's an honor um, thanks for saying that we'll see do you have time to take a question I'll do what we can. Sure, Catherine. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, do you book your own trips? Do you work through an organization or a tour company? Yeah, um, yes. I, so I do this through Mountain Travel Sobek. So you I could see. find all the details on this trip um, if you went to Mountain Travel Sobek's web page. And I think if you just were to type in Sobek, S-O-B-E-K, you would come to their website and you can see all the incredible trips they do all over the world um, and including several in China. Um, so yeah, that's, that are the people you sign up with that do all the details and the logistics um, for the trip. And I'm just the person who leads the way working with uh, Chinese guides and the Chinese Rangers. Well, it sounds like most of their itineraries are pretty unique and maybe uh, customized. They are. This is something that uh, really no other travel company does this. I have seen some American companies that go to Wangshan, um, but uh, it's really off the beaten track. Um, we're not going to the Great Wall or Yangtze Cruises or the Terracotta Warriors, but like I say, places that are pretty popular with Chinese people. But when you see a Westerner, when you see a, a, 
a, a Euro person that's kind of exciting, like, hey, where are you from? And they're as likely to be from the Netherlands or Israel as they are from the US. Um, so it's kind of fun to be a rarity, um, even though you may be surrounded by people. They're just- All uh, right, thank you. I'll check those out. Great. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And again, thank you, David, for setting this up. Really a treat to share this with you. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a wonderful day. Bye, week. everybody. All right. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you guys all for showing up, sticking it out. Much appreciated. Right. I'll uh, be in touch at some point down the road. Thanks again, Pete. Thank all right. You. Thank you.